I just got to reflect back to a few moments and I'm like, mm, wasn't as bad as that. And it's okay. To the chagrin of other people, right? I'll look at a situation someone's complaining about and I'm like, like, have you seen like devastation that's occurred in India for an earthquake? You know, like stuff like that, you know, or like. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm thinking of is what a recipe that is for marital strife. Babe, have you thought about the people <laughs> dying in India? Yeah. Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> Who knew I would make it this far? They hated, they never believed me. Yeah, I would never drop the ball. Back. Hopefully you already know what time it is. If you don't, welcome for your first time to the Best Damn Agency Podcast. This is your place, the only place for unfiltered, unscripted conversations about all things digital agency ownership life. And of course, agency sales. I, as always, am your host, JJ Russell. Joining me, as always, my uh, co conspirator here joey gilkey mm. uh but also yeah, joining us on the show uh not always this is actually his second appearance on the show the one the only skylar reeves of ardent growth skylar what's up bro not much man thanks for joining us man great to have you back what does ardent mean it means like passionate passionate uh, passionate, passionate growth, growth. You know? like an erection i think it means like big Big dick growth. Yeah, yeah. It stows it out there on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I dig it. <laughs> uh, so, Skylar, you're joining us, like I said, for the second time. Uh, so, as we get into this conversation, if you want to go back and check out the first interview that Joey did with Skylar, I dug it out of the archives. Episode 122. It's uh, far less interesting enjoyable. To see. Yeah, I, I'm about to say, it'll be interesting to see like how some of your responses or maybe even the business has shifted a little bit. I know you've gone through uh, a metamorphosis so to speak, mm. over the last six to 12 months. So yeah. Um, yeah. we drink often on the show. We're not today. And I kind of I was hoping we were because you have a concoction that you bring uh, to all of our mastermind <laughs> yeah. events. I have the Red Bull, so there's that much at least. You have at least uh, one of the, the 17 <laughs> ingredients. <Yeah. laughs> so you drink these things called Irish trash cans. Is that right? Yeah. What yeah, is great. in an Irish trash can, and how did that become a thing? Uh, so in, in it, I believe it's, I believe it's an ounce of each. So it's triple sec vodka, gin, rum, uh, each schnapps, and blue carousel, and then you put the red bull on top. So, so we'll see an LIP plus peach schnapps and blue carousel. I believe is what it is. So if that's mm. uh, to... It's an LIT plus kerosene, is what I just heard. Yeah, pretty much, Basically, yes. yeah. They're wonderful, though. <laughs> yeah. you, can, you can drink them constantly, and before you know it, like, yeah, they'll, they'll sneak right up on your You're room. unconscious. Yeah. yeah. I, don't yeah. Know how, I don't even know how to discover Before them. you know, you have three cigarettes hanging out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Probably, and one in your ass. Yeah. It was probably sometime in the military. I don't even remember. I've been drinking them forever, so. That's Joey, hilarious. what? You're a cocktail guy. Um, sure. What's your cocktail of choice, and then what mm. is the weirdest cocktail that you have remember trying at least? I mean, let's see. Let's say my drink of choice right now is just Añejo on the rocks. Okay. My cocktail of choice is probably a. It's probably some level of a. Eh, I would say old fashioned, but they're they're just a little sweet for me these days. I'm not a big sweet guy, but. The gayest drink I like, like Pride Month, is is probably a um, I think it's called a New York sour. Ooh. So it's basically a whiskey sour. So it's whiskey sour with like a you know it's got the the whole um, egg white shaken up with the uh, the sour shit whatever that is, and then you <laughs> top it with a little Cabernet Sauvignon top, and. Uh, you know, you get like a. We drank those like, together in. Oh, in Scottsdale. Scottsdale. Yeah, that was the first time I had it because uh, MD was like, "Dude, you should." You had a New York sour. <laughs> yeah, we did. We stayed together too that night. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had a New York sour. He's like, "You ever had a New York sour?" I was like, "I have not." He goes, "You should have one." So I tried it. And I was like, "This is my new favorite." So, so here's a a, a quick fun anecdote about that drink in particular, but really just why you should order interesting drinks, period. Mm. So we were at the Breakers, the Breakers bar, where all cocktails are like $23, $25, $30. It's ridiculous. And I am by far the poorest person there. We're there for a wedding, um, and it was a blast, but it was crazy expensive. So I'm ordering New York Sours at the bar, 
and multiple oh, nice. times, three different times over that six days. It was an Indian wedding. People asked. I had uh, I had people walk up behind me and say, "What are you drinking? I want what that guy's having." And then two of those times, the person who one of them was a billionaire picked up our entire group's tab. And so they, there was like thirty of us. Did he hip and tap then you? They took me back to the bathroom and raped me. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, let's 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 change <laughs> let's transition the banter a little bit. Um get away from the hip tap and raping. It, good looking just to be shown YouTube now. Dude, oh, you yes. took it there. First of all, I was just going like a a slight I left, am turning like... the corner for myself. Okay, great. Okay. All right. All right. You brought the R word. Let's just keep that on record. <laughs> uh Joe, you said something yesterday. <sighs> And I'm interested to hear your additional thoughts and then get Skylar's thoughts. But you basically said, it's interesting that we all wake up in the morning with the paradigm that we want our lives to be easy. Like our metric for success for that day is we want our lives to be easy. Like that's just like what a lot of us uh, default think. We want our lives to be comfortable. We want them to be easy. But what if we changed our paradigm Mm. to... We want to we want to achieve. We want to have fulfillment, right? Like there's something different than we want our yeah. lives to be easy. And then on the back end of that, you said that really that the paradox is the path to a fulfilling life is doing hard things. Am I saying that yep. right? You right. butchered a lot so, of it, but I can repeat it in a very succinct way. Make it smarter so I can clip this up. <laughs> okay. So a lot of us wake up every day and we choose the lens in which we look through our lives and make decisions through and Oftentimes, the lens that we put on is we want to be happy. And so we make choices that we believe make us happy either in the moment or long term. But a lot of times, if we're not if we're not feeling happy, we will run to the things that give us immediate happiness, which is why we tend to run to addiction, food, drinks, porn, whatever it might be, because that makes us happy in the moment. And that's what the lens in which we make decisions through. Whereas if we make decisions through a different lens... One that is, I want to make decisions that make me proud, or I make decisions that make me satisfied. We make decisions far differently, right? We don't we don't take the shortcuts for the happiness. We we make the decisions based on the criteria of this will make me proud in how I act, proud in how I had my day. I lived by my code or whatever it might be. Um, And then to your quote about the hard things, this is kind of like a side note, but still uh, related was. Both the antidote and the preventative measure to a shitty life or bad things happening in life is doing hard things. If you're having a bad day, go do something hard. It will change that. If you don't want to have a bad day, wake up and choose to do hard things, and your life will naturally be better than if you did not. But sometimes we just decide to choose. I'm having a bad day, so I'm going to go choose my vice or my thing. Which tends to make us worse, which then creates perpetual cycle, and it's why most people live a mediocre or shitty life. All right, so here's where this gets interesting. Skyler, in the military, and then parlayed the GI Bill into a philosophy degree, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, been been through a bunch of hard shit, and you're wicked smart, and you think about crazy stuff. Interested to get your take on this. So as Joey's kind of breaking down that that lens or that thought, do you agree with it? And maybe how have you seen that play out either in your past experiences or your present day to day? Yeah. Life's supposed to suck. I mean, the, I'll put it like this, like it's a, um, there's a lot of people, this is what I I thought about this several times is like, I do wonder if we're not somewhat, uh, biased because of who we are, right. And how we are as people. And, um, like I like challenging things because I like growth. I like to, I mean, that's, that's why it's called art and growth, right? Like, it's like, I like to, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know, maybe hard is sometimes, uh, there's a nuance there maybe between hard and challenging, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. um, I think you still need to sometimes go after things that are a little bit outside of your reach, um, but are reasonable. Like, you know, it's not a complete moonshot. That way you do. Uncomfortable. Gain and yeah, they're uncomfortable, right? That way you can gain traction and move forward. But uh it's also it's very easy i think most humans suck at it's everything it's like our, our brains are wired this way right it's like dopamine and everything else we're like we want to um it's a way to put it 
we don't like when things are difficult because we want short term rewards instead of like we can't like, yeah. project into the future that well and think about like what we call like first order like goals, like first order goods and second order goods, right? Yeah. Like that's that's like a fundamental problem. I don't really know the I don't really know how people solve it. That's a that's less philosophical. All right, so if you were to try to isolate then, so if we're wired uh, to make the shitty decision and do the thing that's the sh- you know short term gain, but maybe long term loss. What is the reason then to lean in to hard things? Like what do, what do you gain? What's the reward if you had to try to like narrow it down to doing hard things? Well, I mean, either the, one of you. The outcome afterwards, for, like even though it may be difficult, like that doesn't mean it's not hard when you're doing it, right? But like you can still project forward and see it, hmm. and. I don't know like what motivates it. It's just that like, sure. I, I like, uh, I like being, I've, I'm sure Joe, you've been this way too. It's like, I look back and reflect on what I've accomplished. And that alone gives me the validation that like, that's what the, that's what this, the suck is for here, right here, like mm. right here yep. now. Right? Like, yes, I may not see progress in the moment, but I know that is like, if I look back over any period of time, right, I will see it then. And then it becomes worth it. So. Yeah. Same for you, Joey. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I think for me, there's a... Um, that I just like beating people. I'm sure you do too, Joey, right? It's yeah, like, it's I think winning. part of it's like winning. Part of it's like seeing my potential. Um, part of it's not wanting a, to look back on life and feel like I wasted it. Um, and I think that people who live a life where they just constantly seek the, the shelter and the cave and, and all that, the, the, the safe places... Um, I just feel like they miss out on a lot of the that aspect of life of like, oh, I get to push the boundaries of who I am and who I who I believe I could be. Um, at least I get to find those boundaries, you know. And this is you know, I keep a perfect. This is a perfect transition. So let me dig in right here. Okay. Have you heard of? Uh, and I sent it to you today, Joey. So if you listen to it already, I the answer is yes. Ah, perfect. Have either of you heard of Misogi? No, is it no. a weed no, strain? Like no, dude. It's my favorite concept <laughs> that I've heard in a long time. So, Misogi. I, I actually, it's M I S O G I. But yeah. if you look it up, a lot of the results that you're going to get are this ancient Japanese practice of like uh, ritualistic purification. They would go okay. stand naked in waterfalls, and they believed that it like purified their soul. Well, this. He's like a sports psychologist, biohacker guy. His name's Marcus Elliott. He re- used the phrase, repurposed the phrase Misogi as like this um, impossible feat, like an impossible mm-hmm. task. And so his whole thing is every year or multiple times a year, you should plan and engage in at least one impossible task that has like at least a 50% fail rate. Uh, the Jesse, only other rule is uh, Jesse Eisler, Eisler yes, talks about this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard him talk about the it. The only other rule is you, it can't be something that's going to kill you, right? So there's got to be like a safety valve that where you can be saved. So 50% fail rate, a physical feat that you don't know whether Good or not example. you can conquer. And yes. Good example. Go down in a Titan submersible. 50-50 shots, you implode. <laughs> <laughs> one that's terrible two i don't know if that's the physical feat uh that, that is he's talking about, but... <laughs> <laughs> i think that was just explodey um yeah. so implody. 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 here's the thought though is you know if you go back to the more like animalistic version of humanity uh before all of the the creature comforts that we have now uh, when we were much more primal on a regular basis, human beings were being pushed to their limit. It was like, hey, are you going to conquer this thing? Are you going to conquer this person? Are you going to conquer this situation? Or are you going to die? And a lot of people died. But the people that survived those situations, they learned their boundaries and they expanded their boundaries. So, Joey, you were talking about like self-expansion and what, what am I capable of? And so I think mm-hmm. you know, a lot just, of us. You just described natural selection. Yeah. Yeah. Darwin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Everyone expected to die. So yeah. Like, we're still here, so. so now, so this is like, I guess it's uh, it's applying Darwinian principle Thinking. in a way that doesn't kill you, 
right? And so uh, a lot of pro athletes are buying into this idea. I'm like, I, I kind of want to go do this. Have you guys done anything that you're like, man, this was a an experience that really pressed me, whether it was business or or physical, beyond my limits to the point where I walked away knowing I was capable of more? I think business, I feel like I get that. I get there every year unintentionally just by the nature of, I I am naturally built that way to expand. Like right now I'm doing something. I don't know if we're gonna talk about today or not, but uh, that that's out of my comfort zone, but yet I still have confidence walking into it because of the boundaries I've created prior to this decision. Yeah. Um, But physically not, I mean, not by choice. I mean, like there's been a lot of moments training in football and training for different things that, you know, our coaches pressed us in ways that, which sounds silly because it's a game, but like, you know, sure. like running 40 40s in the dead mm-hmm. of summer really blows. And I didn't think I could do it. And we ended up doing it. But I, I wouldn't say that I make very solid, like cognitive choices physically, which is actually a challenge. So what's interesting is this performance coach, and I'll come to you next, Skyler, but this performance sure. coach, he actually mentions the nurture component of being a kid, being a child who mm. walks through these situations, who gets to sprint 20 out of 40 and has that thought, I cannot do this. I'm going to tap out. I'm going to fail. Yep. But then you press through and you get to the other side and you're like, oh, wow, I can actually do a lot more than I, I think I'm capable of. And I just think about like my seven-year-old, we're not putting her through these ferocious physical challenges, but like I see her limits being stretched and I see her understanding that she's capable of more. So I think the sports thing does map to it pretty mm-hmm. well, just in a different way. Skylar, what about you, man? Business or physically? Like Joey, I don't know that I've done it cognitively. There's been a, f- a few times I think where I haven't in the past, but like, I mean, like even in the military, I just, I just kind of approach each day. Sometimes like when I was in those situations, I'm like, I'm here. And it was never really a question of, um, what, what do I do otherwise? It's like you, you're in a rock and there's a war and that's just how that was, you know, and it's just like, I have no, you had no choice. So, <laughs> it's like, a, a, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. I'm, like, this is, I'm like, I'm like, I'm trying to go to college. Okay. Like that's how, you know, like, and, um, but I would say like in, and even in business, like, I don't know if it's like the entrepreneur side of things, maybe you can chime in here. It's like, sometimes Cause like what you're talking about some extent, it's like being ripped, like inviting risk. Right. And mm-hmm. I'm at risk all the fucking time, you know? So I'm, I'm just like, I'm like, I don't give a shit. What's the worst that's going to happen? I'm not going to die. You know, I'm like file bankruptcy. Okay, cool. Like, you know, like it's, it's like really like what's the worst can happen. So I don't really have as much fear there. I would say like the, the one ahead. time though, that like really stands out was when I uh, decided like, it's like, okay, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to double major and go to philosophy and computer science. And I wasn't, um, like I sucked in math all throughout high school. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm going to go teach myself math before I start college and spent about six months, like relearning everything all the way up through like calculus into linear algebra before I went to college. And like, that was a challenge, but, um, but like, it's like, it's like going through that and like my senior year sucked cause I was doing fucking it was, uh, I think it was, I left college for like enough for like 200 some credits, like enough for like two masters, like a master's degree mm-hmm. and something else. So, I mean, that, like that was stressful, but that's the only Did going through the challenge um, in Iraq where you're getting shot at and death like is on the table, mm-hmm. does it make a lot of the business challenges and risk just feel kind of like not trivial, but just um, like, you know, it's a game and you know, you can't die because you've been in situations where you can die. Yeah, it'll, de- it'll desensitize you a lot. Like, there's not a lot of stuff that bothers me. Like, um, like even when, like when I get hurt, sometimes I'm just like, I just kind of reflect back to a few moments, and I'm like, mm, wasn't as bad as that. And it's okay, you know. Yeah. And um, then that's how I tend to approach things. Like, to the, to the chagrin of other people, right? Like when other people complain, and I have to kind of like tap back into like empathy of like, like I'll look at a situation that someone's complaining about, and I'm like, this. Not like if you've been in, like if you've seen like devastation that occurred in India for an earthquake, you know, like stuff like that, you know, or like <laughs> what's it like when like a five like pound bomb that makes it, you know, but at the same time, like I have to realize that like them in their moment, right? Like it's very real for them. So like that's where it's affected me is like being able to 
kind of scale back and be like, yeah, but their problems are very real to them. All I'm thinking of is what a recipe that is for marital strife. <laughs> Babe, have you thought about the people <laughs> dying in India? Jeez. Suck it up, buttercup. Uh, all right, we're, we're going to make the turn here into business and sales specifically. Before we do, I'm going to make the quickest pitch possible for the best damn agency mastermind. Uh, if you are an entrepreneur, you're doing seven figures, eight figures in your agency, uh, and you're sick of sitting on your ass and staying average. If you are not on the regular basis pushing those boundaries and getting outside of your comfort zone, if you're not getting around other people that are operating at a higher level who are going to push you and challenge you uh, to be bigger and have a bigger impact and influence with your, your business than you currently are, then you need a community uh, and you need a good one. There's a lot of shitty ones out there. You need an elite one. And that's what we operate in the best damn agency mastermind. We are not the biggest agency mastermind, uh, but we are the most effective. We are the most exclusive and we're having high level conversations on a regular basis that are going to press you to go further faster than you could on your own. So uh, the next opportunity for you to jump in is a retreat we're having in Palm Springs this fall. Uh, we're doing something we've never done. We're bringing seven guests. We have a few spots available. So if you're interested in learning more about that, it's a November retreat. You can go to bestdammastermind.com forward slash retreats and have a conversation with us. So Skylar, you are a member of the mastermind. Obviously, Joe, you and I launched this thing together about two and a half years ago. It's the single best marketing investment I've ever made. Oh, thank you. Wow. I appreciate that. Yeah. Clip it. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it does not hurt that you also work with agencies. So you are a marketing agency who works with agencies. Not a lot of guys are in that ne spot necessarily. Um, but as you both look through your perspective lenses at the 25 or 30 guys that are in this group, right? You've got guys who, uh, Skylar, we'll talk about this. Like you repositioned yourself and are really kind of like taken off, but your early stages with your new offer. Uh, then you got guys who are a little bit farther down the road who are doing, you got guys that have been doing this for 25 years who are at four or 5 million. You got guys who've been in this for four or five years who are at 25 million, right? Um, so guys kind of all across the playing field. What is it that separates like who you would consider, and we're not going to throw names out here, but like the highest level operators from the guys who just aren't quite there yet. Like what is the big differentiator not even just talking about top line but guys that you look at your bit their business and you're like oh shit like this guy's on another level what's the the separator mindset mm. mindset and a recognition for talent probably mm. joey expand on mindset what do you see specifically well, i just think that i mean it's it's the whole limits like i think that i think there's folks who uh their success in business is a foregone conclusion you know, whereas I think that a lot of other folks are kind of like hoping it happens to them, whereas other people are like, no, it's going to happen. How it happens exactly, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm pretty sure I know the direction I'm going to start walking in. And then that mindset and that confidence um, propels them to go do and take the risk. And and uh, so I would say that's probably the biggest difference. I think that I honestly think it's the single greatest skill set that you can mindset. possess. And it's not it's not a skill set. I mean, uh, all right, philosopher. It is is mindset, if it is something that can be developed and it is a tool to then be deployed upon all the things that you do, is that a skill set or is it just a characteristic yeah. that you've grown in? Um, well, I mean, I think, character, I think, I think that they're, they're in this, it can be honed, right? Like you can develop mindset. Um, it's uh, uh, to kind of couple that though, too. Something that, that, like, if you look over the long enough time horizon to consider, too, is that. I think what will separate people in the long enough run too is the ability to make fewer mistakes, mm -hmm. like the catastrophic mistakes, right? Like, and I think yeah. that's something that we've like people, it's like some of the people that I've seen, right? Like they've been good at kind of knowing like what decisions not to make that could be catastrophic for the business. Cause that's, it's really easy to ride high. Right. And then one mistake can completely derail you. But um, so being like intentional, right? Like they kind of think through their like some like risk reduction and this like some of the decisions they make whenever it's um, there's like that tipping point, right? Between like there's like you want to accept risk, but there's a point at which the the reward is not worth the risk too. So that's what I've kind of seen in some of the intuition folks. and discernment. Ooh, I've been on this kick yeah. lately. Which I've been, I've are been on not the about same sales. thing, but they're not. <laughs> But I've been on this kick lately about like sales reps. I'm like, why is it that sales reps blow? And it's like, because the best ones uh, have developed ambition, drive, mindset, whatever. And then they have intuition, 
and they have discernment, which you can develop those, but you got to do it, develop it through repetition and doing. But intuitively, you've got to, like you said, like these these people who are successful are successful because they intuitively can kind of start gauging. Like this is the offer, this is the market, this is the hire, this is the fire. Intuitively, no, and then discernment is like, okay, is it the right time? Do I do it now? Do I pull the trigger? Do I pull off, etc. It's the whole lanes and lanes and speeds thing that I talk about on highways. I would say, Joey, like on those, just you and I working together for three years. Like I would give you a ten out of ten on intuition. Mm-hmm. Like I think you're very, um, I think you said it is like a sixth sense. Like it's just this ability to kind of like know what the next right step is, right? Yep. I think discernment is where just through experience, like you're learning, right? And so yeah. you'll make decisions that feel right and you're almost always right, but you have stepped on some landmines. And so Skylar, what you're saying, and everybody does, but yep. it's like who can step on the fewest landmines and make the fewest catastrophic mistakes. And so we've talked about it a lot since we relaunched the podcast. Joey made some business model decisions that ended up being landmines and they exploded. And there were some team decisions and some hiring decisions that, that just required a significant pivot. He's made it. And now I'm like, wow, this is, the, the form of the business that now exists, I think, is the one that's got a chance to go as far as he wants it to go. Um, but the intuition's always been there. I think discernment's the one that yeah. I've watched you kind of hone in over time, which I think is pretty cool. Yep. Um, all right, Skyler, I want to get into your business model a little bit. So, And we'll talk about sales and marketing as they're combined here. And you have a, a unique perspective, I think, on marketing for agencies. But talk about the shift that you made to, I don't know if it's exclusively, but um, high priority or high, higher prioritization of agencies as a, an industry you're going after. What are you doing for them? Yeah, basically their marketing. I mean, it's, it, well, that's like kind of what it is. It's, it's, it evolves quickly beyond that just because of like me running a business as well, right? Running the very similar type of business, it, I very quickly become a sounding board for like strategic decisions, um, whether it's related to uh, more, it's more and more operations just because of like my, opinions on on operations mm-hmm. that differ from a lot of uh conventional wisdom out there but and then some when it comes to sales like you know and i tell people like talk to joey like I can't <laughs> tell people i'm on a call with i can't I, i'm not i i'm not gonna say i can't it's not my strength to build and run sure. sales teams right but um but that's also because i believe if you market well enough you don't need sales so but it's also no. true. what's the talk about the proprietary tech too that yeah. you've built a lot of the kind of the initial discovery off of yeah so that was uh we that's like from the byproduct of where i had a problem that no one was solving and i wanted to go solve it right so i built it for myself so we basically wanted to know like how do we know what the best content to create in what order to get the like the best results in least amount of time would be like to like maximize efficiency through making the right decisions if we're going to invest resources how do we um uh, consider opportunity costs which is like something a lot of people just don't think about Uh, so we built some tech just to help us make better strategic decisions when it comes to trying to capture more uh, demand through search. Um, and from there, it's kind of evolved into now let's look more holistically at the, at, you know, at the market, like where's the market at? What is the offer? What's the message? Where are they at on channels? How do we effectively reach them on, you know, whether it's organic, social, paid, social, paid search, organic search, email, Substack, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, yeah, the tag, I mean, built that algorithm. It's evolved more and more over time. We tried to turn it into a SaaS model and then I quickly realized I didn't like running a software company. Um, and so now we've tough. really kind of, yeah, it's it's just, it's like, I don't um, I don't want to manage the team and, and have to deal with everything that goes along with that. And um, so now we've kind of brought it more close to our chest where we, we use it as sort of like that unique mechanism, right? Of like how we're able to, um, help people make the right decisions and fewer people, which I think makes it more valuable too. That way it's not just democratized across the market. So it's the secret sauce is yeah. what it is. Yeah. It's sauce. Um, yeah. so as Quick you, question. Hold on. You hold may- on. Yeah. Hold the fucking phone. Okay. Fine. I, have a, I have a more, uh, deep question. So now, what the it. fuck does your headline mean on your website? Oh, Dog. it's like most, yeah, so it's uh, it's, it's an idea around uh, marketers who normally suck at marketing themselves, right? Because it's very easy. I, th- I think uh, I think I'm not speaking alone when I say that a lot of marketing agencies is are marketing their customers. They always want to market themselves more, but it's very very easy to mm-hmm. allocate your resources to more client work because mm-hmm. that's where the fire is, right? Instead of t- 
you know, instead of thinking about the important but not urgent items. And so that, and sometimes it's frankly, it's hard to mark yourself because you're too close to it, right? Like you think you know what your customers want, but you don't actually really talk to your customers enough to know what the fuck that they care about, right? So that's uh, But what is your headline? Because it makes me laugh when I read it because I'm like, I swear this is misquoted or something. (laughs) It's, uh, I think for sure it's like, stop stop trying to eat your own dog shit and, and, like let us eat it for you. Think of what it was like. Yeah. It was literally the byproduct. So they give you some what insight here. What, who so is dog Zach, shit? <laughs> yeah. So Zach Williams. Um, I think it's dog food, Zach dude. <laughs> nah. 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 Okay. Like, yeah, my bad. Yeah, I know. I know what you. I know. I know. What you're, I know what you're saying. It's a. Uh, it's okay. like I stop trying to. Like, stop trying to like sell your own just, shit or eat your. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, it, it sounds better. It sounds better when you curse. So Zach Williams oh, uh, was at when we were in Tahoe. He had said that, and uh, uh, I think it was uh, Sean from Symbol Tiger. You know, it, it said something on. So he was like, "Oh, Scott will put that on his website. He doesn't care what he puts on there." And I was like, "No, be on there in five minutes." <laughs> so, okay, so you both uh, to that point like have what Joey has eloquently. Uh, coined he didn't coin it but just very much like the fuck you brand right so you both just like we don't give a fuck we'll put it on our website we'll say whatever uh we'll be a little bit rebellious joey maybe make it prettier in terms of how you think about it uh clean it up for me but then also like do you find that that helps you uh, is it an asset in your sales conversations like are people actually buying into that brand do you think it comes back to like my overall life philosophy like zero fucks to give not even that. No, it's deeper than that. I think that's cheap. Like, I think that ultimately it comes back to, like, I live by a code and I live by a standard that I set for myself. And that's not dictated by other people. It's what I want for my life because it's my fucking life and none of you guys get to contribute to it, right? Unless I invite you to contribute. And so you're not going to be there at my funeral. You weren't there at my wedding. You're not going to be there at my first, you know, my firstborn or my secondborn's birth. You're not going to be there with the fights with my wife. You're going to be there with the sex with my wife, thankfully. <laughs> like all the things that go into what makes life beautiful, you're not there for. And so why should I allow you to contribute to how I live that life? And so I think that just bleeds into my brand of like, I really don't care what you think. And I'm so good at what I do that it doesn't matter if you try to cancel me because my brand is too abrasive for you. I will find a way. And so if I'm going to do this at all, I'm going to do it how I want to do it. And I'm not going to be apologetic whatsoever. That's my philosophy. Yeah. So, so by the way, Joey will be at my wedding though. So, um, that's right. The, <laughs> hurry the freak think, up and get married, dude. <laughs> how she, okay. Um, I think for me, JJ, it's the, um, I mean, for one, like I look at it and I'm like, no, these are fucking words. So like, if this is, if this is a, if this is a problem, we probably weren't going to get along in a, in any yep. sort of like engagement anyway. Um, I think like the, it's like on our, like a bow page, right? Like we talk about being fucking legendary where like our, our basic litmus test is there's three ways to be in life. Like you can either, uh, you can either fucking suck at something, right? Or you can be uh, like mediocre, okay, but or you can be fucking legendary and like why, like why would you do anything but just try to be fucking legendary, right? So the um, we use language like that or talk that way or you know whether it's in sales or whatever, just because like I know who I am, I don't have a um, but maybe it's candor, right? I don't know, but like I'm like, look, I'm not here to uh, what's you know what like step on eggshells, whatever. Like I'm, I'm here to you. I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm here to make you fucking money, right? Like it's like if you either want to make fucking money or you don't, and and if, if words are the thing getting in the way or certain like certain philosophies, then great. There's other, there's other people. <laughs> so. Well, it's, it's the whole like polarization. You're going to create a camp that loves you in a camp that either is indifferent or hates you. But all I need is, is the select few that love what I'm up, what I'm about. It's all scholar needs. We charge enough for it. So yeah. If you cater to everybody, you know, you're not serving anybody kind of no. idea. Nope. Yeah. We are meant as people to be divided. We're not meant to be united people. Hmm. That could be like a podcast episode in and of itself. I feel like it's actually oh. every one of our podcasts. It's houses. literally our in our DNA. Like we're just we're so different. There's literally no there's there's nothing that should unite us. But like holistically mm. in every category. Unless aliens attack our planet. We'll, we'll yes. Yes. <laughs> Although I did see like a nineteen nineties movie. 
that had some weird uh, <laughs> implications on if aliens attack. They ended up divided. I'll leave it there. All right. Do they impregnate uh, us? So <laughs> it's a long story that right. I literally can't share on the podcast, and okay. that's saying a lot because we've said a lot of stuff on here. Okay. Um, Fair. All right, so Skyler, you reworked the company uh, and repositioned towards agency specifically. Joey, you, I feel like, really reworked your offer. Uh, mm -hmm. Still targeting primarily agencies, but it, a lot of it had to do with the offer. Um, Joe, you've got what you call a no competition positioning statement. And so maybe we can look at it through that lens. But as you sure. were finessing the new offer or finessing the new TAM or whatever and trying to figure out how to find a message market fit, which we've talked a lot about on this, this show, um, how did you go through the process of actually like picking from the unique selling props or whatever you do, like the, the service you provide? what makes the company distinct and then packaging the wording together, the verbiage together into what you're presenting to either prospects or uh, what you're pitching on a sales call. I'll let Skylar go first, unless he wants me to go. I've always got, I'm, I'm ready, fingers on the trigger at all times. I'm ready to rock. I'm, I'm interested in hearing yours. I mean, cause we're, we're still working on, we're finding our offer. We played around a few ideas, yeah. like throw some out there at the end, but I'd like to hear about yeah. the, about your process, the message market fit. You know, uh, well, it's not even the, the process for message market fit as much as like, I just think that I think there are frameworks to help you start swimming in the lane you want to swim in. But I think that overall, like, and people are going to hate this because it's not practical. Like, I think that it's through repetition, listening and intuition that we eventually get to where we get to. Like, you, you don't just create offers out of thin air without having like gotten the repetitions to know buyer behavior and all mm -hmm. the things that go into that and so like now the, the the how do you get in your lane is pretty simple the no competition positioning statement it's not something you actually slap on your website and say this is who we are but this is just the ethos of like here's what we create for is we help fill in the blank audience person specific icp or target account uh, achieve accomplish whatever blank what is the the goal in which they would like to obtain without what is the pain that they would typically have to experience in order to obtain that goal outside of working with you through intellectual property framework, whatever your unique selling proposition is. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Dreyer told me the other day about, uh, I guess he's, um, he was doing some training or he was some guy, Cole Gordon, uh, who's the closers.io guy. He's an internet marketer, sales person, um, uh, but he, he calls it the unique mechanism. It's like, cool, dude. Like we're all fucking marketers here. We get it. You just ripped and duplicated like 17 other people's IP, but I get it. And I like the way he positioned it as unique mechanism. Like that in and of itself is his way of like creating his way, but like unique mechanism is like, what's the, what makes you different than the rest of the market? And yeah. sometimes it's through it's like, like, what is your, what, what's your IP? It's a in that old book. Yeah, dude. It's, it's just, it's, it is, what is your unique selling proposition and it might literally just be the name in which you call your process yep. hmm. like what i what i do for for message market fit i call it outbound r d it's an amazing name everybody gets it the moment they hear it if they know what r d means and if they're an intellect they probably do and so it's an incredible name but all it is is like hey we're gonna like figure out what your message to the market is and we're going to make assumptions and then we're going to figure out who your ideal customer is. And then we're going to go sell for you for like six weeks, eight weeks and get the data back on this is message market fit. And we will iterate along those hundred conversations we have over the course of six to eight weeks. And we will have done outbound R and D to deliver what is message market fit and what is channel viability and what's your strategy. It's a badass offer, but it's not, the, it's just, it's my IP. It's great. The unique mechanism. So it's your it's unique a unique mechanism. mechanism. Thanks, Cole. Skyler, what about you, man? You said you'd slap something on the end. Yeah, I mean, we. So the way we arrived at here, more or less, was looking at who we'd been working with, and then I uh, like just finally like started applying real business strategy, right? So like a lot of people confuse strategy with planning, and so we adopt like Roger Martin's framework, and, like playing to win. It's like mm. what's the winning aspiration? Like where am I going to play such that I can win? Like choose the choose the playing field of your choice. How am I going to win? Like how will I win on that playing field? I've chosen I've chosen to compete. What are my must have uh, capabilities um, in terms of like what must be true about the world and what I must be capable of in order to win? How I want to win? Where I want to win to achieve whatever I want to achieve? And then what are the enabling management systems that have to support that? 
as we, you know, to keep us on track as we go. And so we applied that, went through it, uh, went through several different kind of iterations of figuring out like, okay, like, is this a problem? Let's validate this is a problem. Uh, what is the problem? What are they willing to pay? You know, things like that. And it's still been evolving and we've been figuring out and it's a question of like, what's, what's the capacity that we want to handle? Do we want to stay much more like fractional CMO style? Like where we come in and literally tell agencies to like, you just worry about making money, um, about like closing deals and running your team and let us just go like bring everything mm -hmm. in for you. Um, and, uh, that works pretty well whenever they just let us do that. It's, um, but we've been, we've been figuring out like, like, what do they want? What's the real pain points and something we've been kind of toying around with lately, like some who just want search, like the kind of co the term that we coined was like total searchable market. Um, you know, it's a little different from a TAM. So we've been helping people kind of get that and then how they can use it for their own That's customers. Cool. But an offer we have been playing with lately is, uh, uh kind of adapting a, a playbook of like, cause we, we've had a lot of people ask us like, what do we get for, you know, 10 K a month? And it was hard to articulate what it was because we, it's, it, a lot of people look at it as, oh, I'm buying these things. And we're like, you're buying whatever it takes that month, like what, it, like based on your business and what you need. And that was kind of hard to articulate to people sometimes. Um, but one thing we've played around with is just tell people they can get unlimited content. They're like, what do I get for taking unlimited content? <laughs> one at a time. That's pretty sick. One at a time, <laughs> unlimited um, content. I like that. It's awesome. It's uh, it's sticky. You have a unique purview into a lot of agency, like marketing strategies and results. Uh, where does that? So we talk a lot about agency sales falling mm -hmm. apart. We've talked around that in circles. Um, where do you see agencies getting marketing wrong most frequently? Uh, and outside of bringing somebody like yourself in to solve all those problems for them, what are some quick fixes or things they should be evaluating. They fall in love with their own channel. Ooh. Okay. Most often everything's a, you know, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. That's probably like the number one problem. Like when I see SEO agencies who are just like, mm. they just really fucking love SEO. And I'm like, you know, there's a lot of people who use other channels and you know, it's uh that's, that's like the number one. It's just trying to get them to not just be so beholden to their own channel. Yeah, they're romantic about it. Yes. Yeah, just mm. extremely romantic and and thinking that it's the greatest thing in the world and a lot of them aren't that good at like really sussing out the data they don't they don't have like the rev ops background or the like the analytics background to really uh they think they do right but like th uh they don't tie it together with like real world data um mm -hmm. like on the qualitative side to really see the insights yeah um, that's the biggest problem is is, is either a they fall in love with the channel or b they have the they they have uh sculpted the data to fit their own narrative um, and so that before, I'm just like, it's not like this, this like, here's, here's what's really happening. Um, once we get past that, um, then it's okay. So Joey, what do you mean? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you mean our entire government, Wait. pharmaceutical industry, <laughs> insurance industry, banking industry, federal reserve. They Private don't do equity. that. <laughs> they don't do that. Okay. Never, never. Nobody twists the data. Joey, do you, do you have anything to add there? Because if not, I've got a on no, the marketing go. side. The whole that was thing. smart. Okay, that was really smart. So I'll clip that and we'll post that somewhere. And if it's on my LinkedIn, it's going to get like three likes, and two of them are going to be Joey. So uh, I'll throw it in there too. I talked about this the other day in Slack where they where a lot of them suck too. Is they don't view uh, it's it. I was talking earlier about the operations side of things where they think about utilization more than throughput. And the reason why I tied that to marketing is they. They view their business um, in terms like, so they, you, a lot of people view utilization as a, as a cost center, right? It's like, how do I maximize, um, you know, what I'm already paying for? How do I get the most value of it? Instead of thinking about how they provide the most value to the customer, because they view an underutilized employee as just pure cost that they want yes. to reduce. But they don't think about the hidden costs associated with having employees balancing mm -hmm. multiple things or not increasing the velocity at which a deliverable or whatever your, whatever value, like reducing time to value for the customer. Mm -hmm about reducing that time and I'm like to flip, like flip it on its head. And that's, I view that as a marketing issue because if you do it right and you put the cut, like reduce time to value for the customer, don't worry about fucking utilization. It'll take care of itself in the back end, but like flip it, focus on the asset through to the customer. And what'll happen is you'll have happy customers. They'll buy from you more frequently. They'll refer you to more people. Like it's just it like it, it's shit. Like that can alone can become a unique mechanism. Like, but it's 
I don't know. That's a that's a hard thing uh, for. It's a hard to sell. Get their heads. Yeah, it is. it is. Spend more money for no upfront return. But it's not. Um, it's actually just like you just got to show them the math. I mean, that's it's it's, it's more a, caring. Uh, yeah. Yep. It's a longer carry. You guys are both uh, business owners. You're both involved in like growth slash uh, sales, right? In, in some capacity. So you get sold to a lot though. So you have this unique perspective as somebody who's involved in building sales ops or marketing and you get sold to all the time. What, like, if are you, will you take an FTA? Will you take a first time appointment or a discovery call with somebody? What's it take for them to actually get you on their calendar? Um, and if you will take one, what's the right length for a discovery call? Hmm. Uh, I don't get on many new these days because... I don't really have anything I want to buy. Um, and your calendar is ridiculous. But it's also true. Um, I have gone on a few recently. And every if I look back, every single one of them had to do, they all came hyper-personalized. Ooh, okay. Uh, yeah, every single one. Specifically, like hyper-personalized email or anything else? Yeah, one guy... One guy referenced my LinkedIn post where I gave like some pretty gnarly advice. And he like screen shared the LinkedIn post with him in the corner. And he's like, Hey, Joey, loved your post. I actually went and applied this with my sales team yesterday and talked to my VP of sales. Cool. Blah, blah, blah. Already getting some excitement around the team around this. So thank you for being super generous with it. Here's why I'm actually reaching out though. And then he jumped in. I was like, oh, Okay, cool. And it was, it was interesting. I didn't buy it, but I, I got into the, the FTA and at least get him. I got him to get to the point where he could pitch me something, but was it a 30 minute call? I think he put it on the counter for 30. I don't think we we're on there for 30 though. 20. Maybe I'm always super interested in these companies, agencies that are booking like 60 minute discovery calls. Bro. Like, dude, that's just, too, I would never, like, I would literally never do that on their calendar. I had a guy <laughs> yeah. do that the other day. Uh, he, he booked, um, 30 for an intro meeting it had nothing to do with sales it wasn't me selling him or whatever and i told him 15 he booked 30 and i declined the meeting when he sent it to me i said send me another one yeah. for 15 or else i'm not showing up and i don't want to be a dick she's like dude you told me 15 i said i'd be there for 15 i said okay and you send me for 30 and it's overlapping with something else i'm doing so just send me another one and we're gonna stick to the parameters here skylar what about you man what's it take to get you on a call Catch me at the right time, frankly. Um, <laughs> most of the time, what happens is I, I can tell you the last time I took a um, uh, that I, that I took a took a meeting like that. It was it's usually more often than not what happens is I reach out to them wanting to, wanting to meet uh, right, and then I have to get jerked around through a fucking SDR or whatever, like yep. to, before I could take a call. And like half the time I'm like, look, I know I'm qualified. I fucking like, I just want to buy. You just don't, you know, I just don't have the way to do it on your website. Let me give you money. Right. Okay. Like, that's <laughs> what happens. And I still have to go for an SDR. But uh, as far as length goes, I mean, <clears throat> I think like if I truly don't know about something, like uh, we can probably figure it out in about 10 minutes if they have some good questions and then we can figure out like, do we need to continue talking? Sure. Um, I like that's going with fun. like, just like, like short, short increments of time. And, uh, yeah, seven minute meetings are the best because then like you leave yourself with like it's it's a regular and then you've got three minutes off the back end to get back on schedule or do whatever. But the uh, what's always worse is whenever I get into a discovery call and they start going through shit. And uh, this happened not too not too long ago, probably about less than sixty days ago. They went through a, a whole deck and it was about thirty five minutes. So I'm just sitting there, right? And at the end, they're like, "Do you have any questions?" I'm like. Guys, I just wanted to know in the beginning how the fuck I can pay you. I was like, I already knew I wanted to buy this. I'm like, just how, how do I how do I give you my money? <laughs> right, and it's like maybe lead with that. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. So that's why I always start the call. So this is how I always start a call: is hey, so just gonna tell you how calls typically go. People people are coming from somewhere on this spectrum of. I'm here because I was intrigued, but I actually don't really remember why I'm here. I just know how to do a sales and I'm interested to, I know exactly who you are. I followed you for a while. I understand your content. I know your offer. I'm here because I'm super, super interested. Where do you fall? They're like, probably more of the former. I said, great. Let's start there. 
And so it's just a real easy way to benchmark like, okay, on this spectrum, are you interested because you're informed or are you interested mm. because you're intrigued? Yep. Oh, that I was like good. That. Damn. That was it really, really good. was good. That was IP coming out just, just out ready. Bad. It's so applicable to so many different like use cases in life too. So. Oh, yeah. That, that's got to go in the memo, man. Is the memo still a thing? Yeah, I'm just like once a month right now. It's good for me. You write that one down. Put it in the margin memo. Or just LinkedIn post. LinkedIn. What did I say? Uh, intrigued or informed. Got it. Are you interested because you you're intrigued or intrigued because you're, you're informed? Got it. Cool. Yeah, that's fire. It's good. All right, let's end with Unconscious this. competence, baby. There you go. I know. Don't take me through this. We don't need to. I'm not going to. <laughs> just showing it. All right. those folks at home. <laughs> There's a thousand uh, ideas or development things that you could be grabbing onto at any point in any time. Um, for your personal development, like what is, what's the idea or the goal that you are most like dogmatically pursuing right now for yourself? It could be business, could be personal. It could be both. What am I pursuing from a development yeah, like perspective? You have an, an ideal, oh yeah, dev, yeah, development. I mean, I think in business, like, yeah, I mean, I think for me, and this kind of goes back to the, just, it's funny you mentioned the margin thing is like having margin in life does not mean that you don't have massive ambition. Uh, it just means that you're extremely intentional with what you say yes to. And so right now I'm saying yes to a lot of things, but I'm actually saying no to a lot more things, surprisingly, that I'm saying yes to, and it still means my calendar's full. Um, but I think as a whole, I'm, I'm trying to like push myself in being amazing in all facets of life. Like I just, I think I can. I don't think you have to choose. I don't think that you have to be a an amazing dad and not an amazing business owner. I think that you can be a great husband and also make a shit ton of money and spend less time with your wife, um, building businesses. And I want to go out and prove that to myself more than anything. So I think it's probably where I, that's, that's my like pursuit right now. I also like cold plunges, getting real into cold plunges. Just a little. It's your miso. It's your miso. I want Do what? We, like we don't have a place to do it around here. So I was like, I'm just like, browsing online and like hmm, okay maybe so they're fucking really they're over expensive i I'm almost want to build a really badass one that would probably i could probably sell it for seven grand but you could probably build it for 1500 to two grand yeah probably but anyways cold Skyler, what, what what is it for you Skyler? what's the what's the thing that you are most in pursuit of so you know, okay so you know the back history there was like 18 months around solving the one algorithm for search and then when i solved that i basically didn't give a shit about search anymore so that was fun and now it's uh i've done this is like the third time when it comes to algorithms like i just like to solve out algor- like create algorithms to solve problems i've been wanting to, this is more of a business like venture but it's to help me in my personal life too by solving some of my own internal problems and that's i want to solve the problem of how do we actually find integrators for visionaries um, algorithmically um, so oh. that's what I'm currently working on is like, how do we find the right, you know, integrator for that visionary? Um, and also I can introduce you to the number one visionary and integrator coach in the world. If you would like that intro. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm open to it. the, um, I think it's, it's like a lot I've seen people try to tackle the problem. They just never tackled it in a way that I think, uh, it basically just ends up like the, you know, like Tinder, where you've got like nine percent <laughs> dudes and one percent girls, right? And like, yeah, like, maybe we need to evangelize and make more people aware that maybe they have the capacity to be an operator, right? And like make it, you know, something worth pursuing. Educate, you know, letting people kind of uh, flourish there. But then also, the when I talk about algorithms, it's like so we did this like with coaching a while back when it came to running coaches and things like that. And, and, uh, I've done it in like the driver space too, with in the semi trucking space. But it's like, how do you find the right pairing between two people like match.com style? Right. Yeah. So that's what I'm pursuing. Cause I would like to solve yeah, it. For it'd be cool to have like a speed dating version of oh, it. Be, that'd be sweet. It'd be super helpful to like, cause, cause a lot of people like they'll, they'll get into a visionary integrator relationship and you don't have a lot to compare it to necessarily. 
you just know like I'm a visionary and it's not me. And so it must therefore be helpful. And I don't know that that's the case for everybody. And so hmm. having that ability to kind of see what different integrate, that's one thing I think EOS really screwed the pooch on that could have been massive for Gino. And listen, I'm sure he's been very successful. So who am I to say, but is he didn't aggregate visionaries very well. He attracted hmm. integrators. Uh, he made visionary salivate over it, but he never created something that I, that I know of like a community for the visionaries where he could then start feeding his integrators into. And I think that would have been beneficial for the integrator and it probably would have attracted more integrators because as I'm learning, as I run a fractional specialist model with VPs of sales is if you can provide the leads and the opportunities, the solid people will come. Hmm. Um, so anyways, yeah. You know, what they did with, I think it's like, uh, with Rocket Fuel, like, and they've got that website over there, they got a forum, right? But the problem over there is you have, like, an overabundance of visionaries and not very many integrators, right? And a lot of people don't know that uh, that maybe they could be an integrator. So it's, yeah. I think th there's some education that needs to happen there. But then especially, too, like, if you get the wrong pairing, like, it's a waste of, it's a waste of fucking time. And uh, there's a way to do that right when it comes to, sure. you know, question mm -hmm. profiles, personality profiles, what are the problems, what are, you know, it's what skill sets, et cetera. Right. So it's so really like, Hey, I don't know if I can solve the problem completely, but, uh, I'd like to make a dent in it and help myself and other people. Solve it, man. Be badass. That's a cool endeavor cool. to take on. I love it. Uh, all right, man. Well, thanks for hanging out with us. We got to wrap this thing up so people can enjoy their Friday nights, whatever they're doing. Uh, where can people find you Skylar? If they want to engage with what you're building with the company or with your content? Best place would probably be LinkedIn. Outside of that, uh, join the best damn agency mastermind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, join the mastermind. You can hang out with Skylar. And you can hang out with all of us. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, or check him out, Skylar Lee Reeves on LinkedIn. And go back and listen to the other interview, episode 122 of the best damn agency mastermind. As always, if you're a loyal listener or if you're here for the first time, we appreciate your attention and your time. Rate, review, subscribe. Check us out on YouTube. It's more fun. Uh, we're starting to build a, a little audience over there. And as always, to those of you uh, on this call with me, I appreciate you guys. We'll see you all here next week for the next episode of the Best Damn Agency Mastermind. Nope. Podcast. Peace. Gang. Whoa. Who knew I would make it this far? They hated they never believed me. Yeah. I would never drop the ball. I know I make it look easy. Yeah. Maybe.